Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a tequila sunrise. What do you have, Dal? I am drinking a peach daiquiri, and in this week's episode, we will be looking at the events surrounding the murder of Matthew Shepard. Matthew Wayne Shepard was born on December 1st, 1976 in Casper, Wyoming, to Dennis and Judy Shepard. His younger brother, Logan, was born in 1981. As a child, he was, quote, friendly with all of his classmates, end quote, but was targeted and teased due to his small stature and lack of athleticism. He developed an interest in politics at an early age. Saudi Aramco hired his father in the summer of 1994, and Shepard's parents subsequently resided at the Saudi Aramco residential camp. During that time, Shepard attended the American School in Switzerland, from which he graduated in May 1995. There, he participated in theater and took German and Italian courses. He then attended Catawba College in North Carolina and Casper College in Wyoming before settling in Denver, Colorado. Shepard became a first-year political science major at the University of Wyoming with minor in languages and was chosen as the student representative for the Wyoming Environmental Council. In 1995, Shepard was beaten and raped during a high school trip to Morocco. This caused him to experience depression and panic attacks, according to his mother. One of Shepard's friends feared that his depression had driven him to become involved with drugs during his time at college. Multiple times, Shepard was hospitalized due to his clinical depression and suicidal ideation. On the night of October 6, 1998, Shepard was approached by Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson at the Fireside Lounge in in Laramie. All three men were in their early 20s. McKinney and Henderson offered to give Shepard a ride home. They subsequently drove to a remote rural area and proceeded to rob, pistol whip, and torture Shepard, tying him to a barbed wire fence and leaving him to die. Many media reports contain the graphic account of the pistol whipping and his fractured skull. Reports described how Shepard was beat so brutally that his face was completely covered in blood, except where it had been partially cleansed by his tears. I know that's so sad. The assailant's girlfriends testified that neither McKinney nor Henderson was under the influence of alcohol or other drugs at the time of the attack. McKinney and Henderson testified that they learned of Shepard's address and intended to steal from his home as well. After attacking Shepard and leaving him tied to the fence in near freezing temperatures, McKinney and Henderson returned to town. McKinney proceeded to pick a fight with two men, 19-year-old Emiliano Morales and 18-year-old Jeremy Herrera. The fight resulted in head wounds for both Morales and McKinney. Police officer Flint Waters arrived at the scene of the fight. He arrested Henderson, searched McKinney's car, and found a blood-smeared gun along with Shepard's shoes and credit card. Henderson and McKinney later tried to persuade their girlfriends to provide alibis for them and help them dispose of evidence. Still tied to the fence, Shepard was in a coma for 18 hours after the attack when he was discovered by a cyclist who initially mistook Shepard for a scarecrow. Reggie Flutie, the first police officer to arrive at the scene, found Shepard alive but covered in blood. Shepard was transported first to Ivinson Memorial Hospital in Laramie before being moved to the more advanced trauma ward at Poudre Valley Hospital in Fort Collins, Colorado. He had suffered fractures to the back of his head and in front of his right ear. He experienced severe brainstem damage, which affected his body's ability to regulate his heart rate, body temperature, and other vital functions. There were also about a dozen small lacerations around his head, face, and neck. His injuries were deemed too severe for doctors to operate. Shepard never regained consciousness and remained on full life support. Candlelit vigils were held in countries around the world. Shepard was pronounced dead six days after the attack at 12.53 a.m. on October 12, 1998.
McKinney and Henderson were arrested and initially charged with attempted murder, kidnapping, and aggravated robbery. After Shepard's death, the charges were upgraded from attempted murder to first-degree murder, which meant that the two defendants were eligible for the death penalty. Their girlfriends, Kristen Price and Chastity Pasley, were charged with being accessories after the fact. At McKinney's November 1998 pretrial hearing, Sergeant Rob Debris testified that McKinney had stated in an interview on October 9th that he and Henderson had identified Shepard as a robbery target and pretended to be gay to lure him out of their truck, and that McKinney had attacked Shepard after Shepard put his hand on McKinney's knee. Detective Ben Fritzen testified that Price stated McKinney told her the violence against Shepard was triggered by how McKinney, quote unquote, felt about gays. In December 1998, Paisley pleaded guilty to be an accessory after the fact to first degree murder. On April 5th, 1999, Henderson avoided going to trial when he pleaded guilty to murder and kidnapping charges. In order to avoid the death penalty, he agreed to testify against McKinney and was sentenced by District Judge Jeffrey Donnell to two consecutive life terms. At Henderson's sentencing, his lawyer argued that Shepard had not been targeted because he was gay. McKinney's trial took place in October and November of 1999. Prosecutor yeah. Kyle Rarucha alleged that McKinney and Henderson pretended to be gay to gain Shepard's trust. Price, McKinney's girlfriend, testified that Henderson and McKinney had, quote, pretended that they were gay to get Shepard in the truck and rob him, end quote. McKinney's lawyers attempted to put forward a gay panic defense, arguing that McKinney was driven to temporary insanity by alleged sexual advances by Shepard. This defense was rejected by the judge. McKinney's lawyers stated that the two men wanted to rob Shepard, but never intended to kill him. Rarucha argued that the killing had been premeditated, driven by quote-unquote greed and violence rather than by Shepard's sexual orientation. The jury found McKinney not guilty of premeditated murder, but guilty of felony murder and began to deliberate on the death penalty. Shepard's parents brokered a deal that resulted in McKinney receiving two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. Henderson and McKinney were incarcerated in the Wyoming State Penitentiary in Rollins and later transferred to other prisons because of overcrowding. Following her testimony at McKinney's trial, Price pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of misdemeanor interference with a police officer. Judy Shepard has worked as an advocate for LGBT rights, particularly issues related to gay youth. President Obama signed the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act on October 28, 2009. This law expands the 1969 United States federal hate crime law to include crimes motivated by a victim's actual or perceived gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. On October 26, 2018, just over 20 years after his death, Shepard's ashes were interned at the crypt of Washington National Cathedral. Jenny, what are your thoughts on the murder of Matthew Shepard? It's so heartbreaking to hear these details and what a horrible, horrible crime. I was definitely familiar with Matthew Shepard before going into this case, but I definitely learned a lot still. Henderson and McKinney deserve life in prison. It's disgusting to hear about the way they enticed him in. I also, I do believe that it was because of his sexuality. I don't really see why their girlfriends would lie about that. It seemed the planning of this crime, too, is really hard to hear. It's so senseless. It There's no reason. And it's frustrating to hear that sometimes something so heinous has to happen for action and protection to take place. But that's the way it is sometimes. I'm sure... His family is happy that something positive has come out of Matthew's death and that there's a lot of people protected and helped by it. And I want to say, too, it's so sad to hear how he was covered in blood and that there were tear stains on his face. Just imagining that is so sad that someone had to deal with that. Another 
quote unquote positive, I guess I'll say, is that Matthew Shepard's story did really expose the United States and I guess the world to what LGBT people have to face. And it I think it did help to humanize the community and their struggles. I think the 90s was really a time where LGBT issues were starting to become more mainstream and more talked about, especially with Ellen DeGeneres coming out. And she, I think, has worked a lot with Matthew Shepard's family. So that's another good uh, to come out of it, another positive. And his parents are so incredibly brave, and I really admiring them for doing what was right and partnering with other families in similar situations to make sure that people have to pay for what they do and you just can't go around hating people and killing them for whatever reason. What are your thoughts? I agree with you. This is such a horrific crime. And just hearing and reading the details about it just makes you sad. And it makes you feel for his family and other families that have had to deal with the same thing or similar circumstances. I definitely think that one of the more positive things to come out of this case was the increased laws that were put on hate crimes. But I think this case also highlighted the amount of hate that surrounds the LGBTQ community. I remember for this case, members of the Westboro Baptist Church, they were like picketing his funeral, saying like, quote unquote, God hates facts and that quote unquote, Matt is in hell, which is just a disgusting thing to one say and also why are you picketing someone's funeral like your homophobia is not welcome anywhere it's especially not welcome at the funeral of a person that just died because of their sexual orientation and i definitely agree that they deserve life in prison without parole I think this is one of those cases that makes you revisit your stance on the death penalty a little bit, at least it did for me, because it's so heinous. And the fact that he was basically tortured and then just left to die, like, who knows what would have happened if the cyclist didn't find him? Like, how long would he have been out there and suffering? We know that he was in a hospital for six days trying to recover and I think it just speaks to how badly he was tortured about the fact that the doctors couldn't even operate on him like how bad do you have to beat someone how much hate do you have to have in your heart for doctors not to be able to do anything to save that person like it's just it's a disgusting case and I think that the girlfriends definitely should have got a bit more time in jail just due to the fact that they would even assist their boyfriends in covering up this crime and their culpability in it. Matthew Shepard is commonly used as an example of a hate crime and as a case that exemplifies the need for hate crime laws. A hate crime is any criminal act or attempted criminal act directed against a person or persons based on the victim's actual or perceived race, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, disability, or gender. A hate crime law is a law intended to deter bias-motivated violence. Hate crime laws are distinct from laws against hate speech. Hate crime laws enhance the penalties associated with conduct which is already criminal under other laws, while hate speech laws criminalize a category of speech. Hate crime laws generally fall into one of several categories. Laws defining specific bias-motivated acts as distinct crimes, criminal penalty enhancement laws, laws requiring a distinct civil cause of action for hate crimes, laws requiring administrative agencies to collect hate crime statistics. Various groups report being the victim of a hate crime. Eight in 100,000 African Americans report being the victim of a hate crime. Twelve in 100,000 Muslims report being the victim of a hate crime. Fifteen in 100,000 Jews report being the victim of a hate crime. And 13 in 100,000 gay men, lesbians, and bisexuals report being the victim of a hate crime. 
Hate crimes can have significant and wide-ranging psychological consequences, not only for their direct victims, but for others as well. Impact on the individual victim include psychological and affective disturbances, repercussions on the victim's identity and self-esteem, both reinforced by a specific hate crime's degree of violence, which is usually stronger than that of a common crime. Effect on the targeted group include generalized terror in the group to which the victim belongs, inspiring feelings of vulnerability among its other members who could be the next hate crime victim. Effect on other vulnerable groups include ominous effects on minority groups or on groups that identify themselves with the targeted group, especially when the referred hate is based on an ideology or a doctrine that preaches simultaneously against several groups. And finally, the effect on the community as a whole. Divisions and factionalism arising in responses to hate crimes are particularly damaging to multicultural societies. Sociologist Jack McDevitt and Jack Levin's 2002 study into the motives for hate crimes found four motives. The first one is thrill-seeking. In this, perpetrators engage in hate crimes for excitement and drama. Often, there is no greater purpose behind the crimes, with victims being vulnerable because they have an ethnic, religious, sexual, or general gender background that differs from their attackers. While the actual animosity presented in such a crime can be quite low, thrill-seeking crimes were determined to often be dangerous, with 70% of thrill-seeking hate crimes studied involving physical attacks. The next motive is defensiveness. Perpetrators engage in hate crimes out of a belief that they are protecting their community. Often these are triggered by a certain background event. Perpetrators believe society supports their actions, but is too afraid to act. And thus they believe they have communal assent in their actions. Retaliatory. Perpetrators engage in hate crime out of a desire for revenge. This can be in response to perceived personal slights, other hate crimes, or terrorism. The quote-unquote Avengers target members of a group whom they believe committed the original crime, even if the victims had nothing to do with it. These kind of hate crimes are a common occurrence after terrorist attacks. The last one is mission offenders. Perpetrators engage in hate crimes out of ideological reasons. They consider themselves to be crusaders, often for a religious or racial cause. They may write complex explanations for their views and target symbolically important sites, trying to maximize damage. They believe there is no other way to accomplish their goals, which they consider to be justification for excessive violence against innocents. This kind of hate crime often overlaps with terrorism and is considered by the FBI to be both the rarest and deadliest form of hate crimes. In order to classify a criminal offense as a hate crime versus the non-hate version of the same crime, detectives and prosecutors must look at what a person said or their past actions to determine a motive. To some, this impacts a person's First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Freedom of speech is protected by our Constitution. Anyone has the right to express their likes, dislikes, and opinions, no matter how offensive it may be to others. This freedom of expression, however, can cause confusion as to where free speech ends and a hate crime begins. Although the line may appear blurred, ultimately, offensive or hateful speech is still just speech and is protected. However, a hate crime is a criminal offense that is motivated in whole or a substantial part by the perceived identity of the victim. Jenny, what are your thoughts on hate crime laws and the line between a hate crime and freedom of speech? It's really interesting to see the different motives for the hate crimes. I never really thought about them being classified into different things. In my mind, I would always kind of lump them together, but 
there definitely are different motives and it, it was fascinating for me to hear about and try to like think of a hate crime in my head and then see like which one I could assign the motive to. I thought that was interesting. I'm glad we have these laws and it's interesting. Again, that's going to be the word of the day. Interesting to see what goes into them because I know that they can be pretty difficult to prove, but they're necessary because we know that there are tons of people around the world filled with hate for different groups of people. So it's not like these crimes aren't happening. These laws are there for a reason. And again, to deter that bias motivated violence. I mean, it is interesting to see how it's so distinct from the laws against hate speech. The freedom of speech thing definitely can sometimes cause like a, a thin line and a gray area between hate speech and a hate crime. I think we're talking about that a lot more now a days with a lot of the there's I think we're talking about that a lot more as a society, at least in the United States nowadays. And I think where the hate speech crosses the line is where there are calls for violence and action plans against groups of people. That's never okay. But I think it is all right to go and look back at someone's rhetoric when they did commit a hate crime, because where there's smoke, there's fire. It's not like all of a sudden McKinney and Henderson in Matthew Shepard's case just woke up and didn't like gay people. There was rhetoric that they spoke, that they, a culture that they grew up in that made them feel a type of way about gay people. And that's how their hate and anger, what it amounted to. And I'm glad we touched on how it does affect the, like a small group of people, a large group of people and communities as a whole, because there are major repercussions for hate crimes. I know in the United States, in recent years with the pandemic, the Asian American community was seeing a lot of hate crimes. And I know just because one Asian American person was victimized, that's now a whole group of people that feel like they need to be prepared when they leave their home and know what to do and have their children prepare for hate, which no one should live in that fear. No one should have to deal with that. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that the reason why someone commits a hate crime definitely connects to the chances that they're going to do it again if they were given a lenient sentence. If you're someone who's just doing it for thrill-seeking reasons, I think that you could likely be rehabilitated. But if you are mission-driven, then likely you are someone whose mind is not going to be changed and the hate that you have for that group of people that you're targeting is not going to change. So you likely need to be in prison for a very long time, of course, related to whatever the crime you committed was, um, especially with the FBI saying that mission offenders tend to be the deadliest and is often connected with terrorism, which of course should have someone in jail for the rest of their lives. I think when it comes to freedom of speech, freedom of expression, I definitely agree that there should be some sort of limits on it. I don't believe in absolute free speech, but I do think that we need to be careful when we look at things that are considered hate speech and just to make sure that we're not looking at someone's speech and then coming up with a crime that they committed afterwards. I don't think that we want a society where people are being arrested for thought crimes. One other thing I wanted to mention was about the impacts on different groups and how I think that a lot of times people focus on the impact on the person and their group, but they don't really talk about how hate crimes can have an effect on everyone and whether people actually feel safe. Because a lot of times, especially when the perpetrator is unknown, you don't know why this person is committing a certain crime. And so the whole community will feel unsafe because, you know, this violent person is on the loose. And you also have other minority groups, especially like we said, when doctrines overlap, where they feel like, oh, okay, this group is a violent group, for example, like white supremacists. So 
I may not be black, but I'm Jewish. And so I might be victimized by that group based on that. And so you get this collection of fear and you also get retaliatory violence as well. We see a lot of cases where it starts off as protest for one thing, and then you have counter protests, and then those two factions clash with each other based on their opposing ideology. And that just creates more crimes, more violence, and more victims, which is not something that we would want in a peaceful, multicultural society. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the murder of Matthew Shepard. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with an episode focused on the 1996 Olympic Park bombing. As always, stay safe.